I wondered how how uh, how CBC was going to uh, take that, and and you know I thought maybe they're going to make me finish with something else other than scripture. And they actually came back and they said they are so proud to tell the story and to tell these men's stories. So it really taught me something. Um, you know, telling a documentary in the words of uh, their words, uh, the gentleman that we interviewed. Uh, there's a broader audience and a larger audience that is actually willing to listen to that and appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, the last question was, would you do anything differently if you could do it again? Yeah, um, I would have started earlier. <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, you know, it was just one of those things like, hey, this is, this is an interesting story. Now, there was a, a point was made to me that a lot of these gentlemen might not have told these stories so frankly um, 10, 20, 30 years earlier. A lot of them felt that, uh, you know, when they were, they were shy about telling it and sharing it, but also there was church leaders that sort of had told the story over, over, over a generation. And so I had somebody say that they were probably a lot more open uh, at this point of their lives uh, because it was urgent for them to tell the story as well. The other thing I would have done differently yeah. was maybe tell, uh, find a part two, tell the story of the, the Mennonites that went to war. For a variety of reasons, whether they're in the Soviet army, the German army, or the Canadian army. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions coming in. Uh, Orlando Redekop asks, "What about a CEO like Frank Peters, who is seriously mistreated in Headingley? How do churches support or not support people like him?" That's either for Andrew or Conrad. Frank Peters. Conrad, I'll answer the first part. Or Okay, go ahead, Andrew. So, so what about why did we tell that? We, we, we briefly touch on it, but at the same time, the demographic, these are the last objectors. These are the guys that were at the back part of the war. Um, they didn't, most of these guys, in fact, none of the ones we interviewed actually experienced that prison situation uh, because they were the ones coming in 43, 44. Okay. And Frank Peters was at uh, First Midnight Church in, in Winnipeg. And he ended up in Headingley, and it's still unclear, at least to me, exactly why he went there and and um, how he was treated, why he was mistreated, and how the church helped or didn't help with uh, him. And there's still a mystery there that needs to be uncovered. Some more research needs to be done. So I don't have a full answer for that. Thank you both. Uh, Diane Dreger asks, when were the interviews, I guess this is for Andrew, when were the interviews with the CEOs who had, who had, when were the interviews with the CEOs who had served conducted and who conducted the interviews? I conducted them and uh, we did these interviews, I believe in 2017, with the exception of one, and that was Doc Schrader. Uh, he's the gentleman uh, who talks about the church owning up to the responsibility. Uh, he was actually done uh, years before as sort of a test. And he actually passed away before we even started the official production of this, this film, uh, which was good that we got him on film. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, we have a couple more coming in, but I'm gonna give people a, a bit of an opportunity to continue thinking about them. Um, Andrew, at one point in the film, uh, there was one CEO who talked about riding in a train car full of military personnel and what that felt like for him. And it was just such a great story. Um, we have a leather jacket on display in the objective area of the gallery um, from Alman Reimer. And he had a very similar story saying, you know, he was on this train full of military personnel and he had his bag with the acts so very conspicuous and he said you know in a very soft spoken kind of tone when he when he donated it back in like 2015 or something and I remember him saying I, I just tried not to say much on the on the train ride so these stories kind of resonate um, can you talk a bit more about what the people you interviewed told you about what it felt like to take a stance that was very unpopular in the wider Canadian society what what stood out to you about their stories you know I think I think every one of them had actually said to go back, they would probably do the same thing. I think in, in of course, knowing after the second war, all kinds of things like the Holocaust, it made them think more about it. Um, but they were all, uh, all at peace with their decision. And of course, there's times where uh, you can see if you look closely, I don't know if you can see it on the Zoom share, but uh, where there's tears in their eyes. And uh, it was also very interesting, um, some of these gentlemen, um, hadn't had a camera put in front of them before and hadn't really told their full story. So some of them 
went on for over an hour. Uh, one gentleman went on for two hours and uh, I was dreadfully worried that, you know, he was going to just run out of gas completely and collapse in front of us. But uh, he actually, uh, right after the interview of two hours, he said, I'm going to go jump on my bike now. He went on the exercise bike. And uh, so, yeah, uh, they were, they were just wanted to tell the story. And that's one of the most notable thing about it. Well, we have a question from Tim Schellenberg. Did Mennonites who served in mental health institutions start alternative and better mental health services? Maybe this is one for Conrad. After the war, yeah, there was uh, more awareness that better mental health care needed to happen. In the United States, there's a very clear linkage between the conscious objector experience and mental health improvements and mental health hospitals that Mennonites uh, contributed to and, and ran. And that uh, in the United States, uh, civilian public service, that experience also moved north. And so yes, there was uh, renewed interest in met providing mental health services for, for the population, for not just Mennonites, but for the whole Canadian population. So things like Eden Mental Health Services uh, do find roots in the conscience objector experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Diane Major uh, asks, and this I guess is directed toward Andrew. Um, are you thinking of doing a film about the women and children who were left behind on the farms and how their lives went when the men were seals? Is there information in the words of these family members? And I guess maybe Conrad, you could weigh in on that too. And as far as an archival record related to women and their experiences during this history. This comes down also to the demographic of men that we were interviewing. They were, these were the ones that were generally 18 years old at the end of the war. They were the ones that were still alive. And so we never got to interview any, and none of the people we interviewed actually had families or, or even, even wives. And so part of that, and you know, it'd be great if we could do, you know, tell all the stories and expand. And it would be great if we could have done a two or three hour project on this. But uh, we were limited to 45, uh, one, because of the broadcaster, but also, you know, there's limited funds. And so we, we kept it to the group of men that, in their own words, were still alive to tell it. And have we thought about it? I don't know. Conrad, has, has the archives ever thought about doing a project about the women behind? It is important, um, but just the scope and time that we had, uh, we weren't able to tell it. I don't know if I've ever considered, you know, a documentary, but there has stuff been written about the families that were left behind, about the women who supported the war. Marlene F has written uh, some articles about that. I've done a little bit of work into that area of women who supported the conscious objector, did their own thing for the, the CEO effort. But as far as a documentary, uh, for reasons like what Andrew was saying, just our timeline now, that's uh, difficult to to see how that would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I struggled with that as well, doing doing the exhibit because it it on the on one level it is very much a, a man's story, right? Women were not conscripted, um, and so yeah. but then you want to tell those stories of of the women who followed their husbands to the camps across the country, or the the women who were left running farms. Um, but the artifacts just aren't there. And, and I wonder if, if that's similar in, in the archives, Conrad, like are there, are there documents related to women and their experience diaries or, or anything like that? There is a little bit, you have to go digging for that type of thing. Uh, yeah, so you, the easiest way to follow it up would be looking at Marlene Epps work or what I've written, checking the footnotes and seeing what the sources are that were used for, for this. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Karen Dick writes, what were the experiences of the SEALs following the war when they integrated back into society alongside the returning soldiers? How were they received back into Canadian culture as SEALs? Um, some men who were SEALs or those who are just a bit younger, who so after the war, were then 18, so they didn't have the CO experience, but were finding work in in the city or places where there were a lot of mixture of, of different backgrounds of people. They would get, you know, 
um, singled out as, oh, you were those Mennonites, you were those church, you guys who didn't do your job or didn't pull your weight. Uh, yeah, they, they found it rough. They were criticized and critiqued and bullied for the exchange the choices that they or even that their older brothers made. So there was some of that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we have any other questions. We'll, um, we'll hang on for a few more minutes if somebody has a, a burning last minute question. Um, but I have one for, for uh, Conrad. Can you explain a bit about the process Mennonite men went through both in the first and in the second world wars to become SEALs? Were there differences in what they had to do? Was it difficult? Uh, could anyone do it? Yeah, so the process was very different from the first world war compared to the second world war. Menites came to Canada on a group exemption. The government said, if you belong to this group of people, you are exempt from military service. If you're a Mennonite, you're exempt from military service. And in World War I, that promise was upheld. World War II, things changed. Now the government said, it's no longer a group exemption. You now have to go individually before the judge, at least in Manitoba and West, and claim and state why you think you should get conscience objection to status. And you have to do alternative service. So now the exemption is, was no longer exemption. You had to do alternative service. That you were not exempt as if you didn't have to do anything. You now had to do something. And you had to appear before the judge individually. So now it was an individual exemption. So the Mennonites, they were never taught how to talk about their faith in those terms, in that way, to argue their case before a judge. So that was something very new. The, the upside of that is that Mennonites now uh, were not the only group who could get conscience of Dr. status. It was now open to anybody, any Canadian. So in the film, we talk about 33 different ethnic backgrounds were conscience of 24 different denominations claimed, someone had someone from those denominations claimed conscience of Dr. status. So there were positives and negatives to that change, but it really moved us from a group identity to an individual identity in this case. Mm. Thank you. Um, and we have one last question here from Victor Cleaver. Could you say something about the Mennonite men in military when they came home after the war? How were they received? So that is a, is very, it varies a lot. Community by community. Um, some um, Mennonite ministers uh, worked hard at supporting the men in the SEAL camps and supporting the men who were in the military. You go to some of these ministers' uh, correspondence files and there's lots of letters back and forth from the guys in the military as well as the guys in the, in the SEAL camps. Um, so some ministers supported them and when they came home, some people will say, oh yeah, the guys who were in the, in the services, they got a big, huge welcome and the SEALs, they were kind of forgotten. Other uh, churches, they said, well, you made a choice to go against what the church has been teaching. So uh, you need, if they were members, if they were members, they were then asked to apologize for what for making that choice. If they were not members, that there was not much that they could do. Uh, so it varied a lot from community to community and their own personal circumstance. Okay. I know the okay. church in Altona, the Al Altona United Church grew out of this experience of men coming home from the service and wanting to start their own church, not wanting to go to, to an existing Mennonite church. So they created their, formed their own United Church. Great. And Andrew, well, I'll give you the last word. Uh, what did we learn making this documentary? Why is it important today to tell this story? Well, it's even more important that uh, they're pretty much all past. So I think it was really important just to get in their own words, their own emotions, their story. And of course, this is a this is an amalgamation of them all, you know, trying to form one story out of them all. And uh, I think all of them were just so really wonderful and interesting to meet. And uh, some of them literally passed away six months after I met them. So it was all the more like, wow, like uh, it, it was, it was, it definitely was a lot of pressure. It was very similar to Fallen, De Fallen Down, uh, the film that we did. Um, every day I see somebody from, you know, that was on that ship in the obituary and, uh, 
it's it's better to get their faces and their the tone of voice and their emotion and sometimes that little tear um because that communicates much better than just a dry memoir or something like that and kudos to conrad for for collecting these materials and collecting these stories over all these years uh i i would have nothing if he hadn't have done that so i always joke like i'm the thief coming in and stealing that you know special cup the golden cup uh to weave it into a story but it's really all of conrad's hard work uh in the archives that that make this happen mm -hmm. so it's a very collaborative effort then Thank you both uh, for being here tonight. It's been a really interesting evening and we're gonna wrap up there. Um, Andrew and Conrad on behalf of MHV and everyone in attendance Andrew tonight. For thank story oh. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, for sharing your research and your expertise on this topic and for taking everyone's questions. Uh, if folks are looking to purchase their own copy of The Last Objectors, you can find them at MHV's Village Books and Gifts in person or in our online store or at Mennonite Heritage Archives as well. As I mentioned at the outset of the evening, tonight's presentation was the fourth event in our speaker series. So be sure to save the date for the next event on Tuesday, October 19th at 7.30 p.m. That's Central Standard Time, where we'll be uh, speaking with Bruxy Cavey. This event will be sponsored by Steinbach Bible College and will be exploring the martyrs section of the Mennonites at War exhibit. That evening's discussion will focus on the development of the theology piece within the Anabaptist tradition. And we're excited to be hearing from Bruxy, who is the senior pastor at the Meeting House, a multi-site Anabaptist congregation in Ontario, and who has written and spoken extensively on this topic and its relevance for us today. Our focus on the topic of Mennonites and their responses to war and violence will culminate in November as we close the Mennonites at War exhibit with an event to mark Peace Sunday on November 14th. The Mennonites at War exhibit is on display at MHV now until November 14th. You can check out our website for an online preview of the exhibit and for details on how to visit in person. But if you can't make it to the museum, we will also be unveiling a 360 degree walkthrough tour of the full exhibit, complete with all the visuals, artifacts and videos that you will see in the gallery later this month. So watch our website for that as well. And of course, by now we're all very used to the idea of pivoting with our plans, but just a reminder that MHV's plans are all subject to the public health restrictions in place at the time of the events, so they can change. The best way to stay in touch with MHV and get the latest information on upcoming events is by signing up for our newsletter, Village News, which you can do on the website at mhv.ca. Once again, thank you so much to Andrew and Conrad for being here tonight, and thank you to everyone who watched and participated with questions. We look forward to hosting you for our next speaker series event on Tuesday, November, uh, October 19th at 7.30 p.m. with Bruxy Cavey. Have a great night, everyone.